I'm giving away not one, but two Swim Nerd pace clocks on the first night of US Olympic trials. Find the link in the show notes to enter. Looking to host your first swim meet or replacing an old timing system? Run a swim meet with ease from your laptop using superior swim timing. You can use superior swim timing with your existing equipment, or they can provide you with a complete timing solution, including deck harnesses, buttons, and starter. SST is fully compatible with HiTech and Team Unify, as well as Colorado, Dactronics, and Amiga touchpads. Go to superiorswimtiming.com to learn more and be sure to tell them I sent you. All right, Casey Barrett, welcome to the podcast, mate. How are you doing? Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, where are you coming from? Coming from New York City. I uh, sit in my office over Union Square in uh, lower Manhattan. Uh, nice. Beautiful day here. Yeah, beautiful, man. Well, how's it, is, it, is it getting back to normal now in New York? Yeah, slow but sure. Um, you know, it's, it's certainly uh, a world of difference uh, from the winter. So, uh, yeah, the, the city's getting back on its feet. Well, listen, you you have known of me and I've known of you in the past, but we've kind of reintroduced to each other just recently. Um, I decided to do a podcast with, with Alex Perry, and, and I know that you had, um, you know, been going back and forth a little bit with him on, on Twitter. So we kind of just reached out to each other in terms of just that aspect of, of yeah. what was going on in the world. But um, certainly didn't bring you on today to kind of, um, you know, go at Alex in any way. Look, I, I um, was very thankful that he came on the podcast and, and it was amazing to me the research that he had done into the IOC and into FINA and, and into the ISL um, and, and the time and effort he'd put into that. And and you've just got to respect the man for that. And But yeah. obviously, you know, there are different opinions out there for, for many aspects and and you have your own in terms of swimming itself, but just in terms of your background, just uh, talk to me about, you know, your own swimming background. Sure. Um, I, I, my swimming background, I guess, peaked uh, in 1996. I competed for Canada in the 200 butterfly. Um, and soon after that, I, uh, I graduated and moved to New York City originally to work uh, for Rolling Stone. I wanted to be in music and be in magazines and Around 99, like with Sydney approaching, I knew a comeback wasn't in the cards, but I really, I, I got that Olympic bug and I really wanted to be around it. So I applied for a gig at NBC Olympics. Uh, I was fortunate to get it and uh, went to, uh, to NBC and worked the swimming venue at that one. Ended up doing four more Olympics with NBC as one of Bob Costas' uh, primetime writers. So um, it's, uh, it, it's a very, very fascinating thing to be be on the other side of uh, of the camera and really see the way the Olympics are are sold and marketed and the way um, these stories are are told. You know, from from an I, I mean, I consider myself a swimmer and an athlete first, I guess, but uh, not far behind. I consider myself a writer, and in addition to the work I did with NBC, I wrote a long time swimming column called Cap and Goggles, and then. Um, have since turned to fiction. I've published uh, three crime novels um, in the last uh, four years. And the first had, first had to do, it was called Underwater, and it had to do with uh, really the, there's a lot of dark sides to swimming, one of which, uh, as we all know, is the sexual abuse stuff that's um, really uh, given our sport um, a black eye in so many ways. And so my first book had, had a lot to do with that. Um, certainly wasn't trying to uh, name names or, or um, you know, spill, spill dirty rumors or anything like that. But, um, but it was a story I think it's worth telling. And I think, uh, fiction, particularly crime fiction is, 
is maybe the best venue to uh, to speak speak truth to power, as they say, um, and without getting yourself in potential harm's way. How did your career end? I mean, were you were you happy with the the way that it progressed and and your Olympic journey and all that sort of thing? Were you uh, a happy swimmer by the time you got out of the sport? You know, I don't think I was ever a happy swimmer. I was, uh, I mean, and I, I, I look back on it and I wish I'd given myself a little bit more of a break. I probably would have swam faster and um, certainly enjoyed myself a little bit more. But as coaches and teammates of mine will attest, um, I was, I was seldom happy. I certainly was seldom happy with any result. It was always, you know, I, it should have been just a little bit, um, Faster, did it quite hit the goal in Atlanta. I was 11th, and my goal going in had been to make the Olympic final. So, you know, came a few spots short of that. And um, yeah, I you know I, I look back on my swimming career and swimming days with with a lot of pride and a lot of gratitude, particularly uh, for the teammates and coaches I swam for and with. But uh, but no, I, I wouldn't say I I wouldn't say happiness was ever really a uh, an emotion that was primary for me swimming. I mean, by the time I graduated, it was uh, from college in 1998, and I kind of had just had an honest look at myself and say, you know, you can be top 20 in the world, and that may be good enough to uh, be a, a pro athlete in countless uh, countless sports. But being, you know, between top 10 and top 20 in the world in 200 butterfly, which was where I, I guess I uh, topped out at, that uh, that didn't seem sustainable. So, uh, so rather than continue through Sydney, I, uh, I stopped when I was 23 at, uh, after I graduated college. So in terms of what were you, were you doing for NBC and the writing that you're doing for Bob Costas, like what did that entail exactly? I, I mean, it was a thrill. It was, it's, we, you know, we, the people that were in that, that room, there was four of us that were primetime writers and there was a little bit of, a uh, a uh, little bit of changing of the, uh, the guard over, uh, it was it was oh four oh six and oh eight when I was in that writers room for Costas and um, I mean it was it was brutally hard just in terms of the hours like it was twenty hour days really for pretty much two weeks straight because in addition to covering the the primetime broadcast we also wrote the um, the uh, script uh, scripts maybe not the right word because they're they're live broadcast but we we were writers for the opening and closing ceremonies too so we would. Be kind of the first on the ground preparing for the opening ceremony um and just the march of nations came with a, a giant binder where every country had uh, at least a page the bigger countries had more than one page where it was you know here are the athletes to look out for here's what they're known for um you know here here their their sports maybe a, a funny antidote or two if, if it was appropriate but um it was it was grueling as as, as hell, but at the same time, I mean, my, my favorite memory by far was in 2008 in Beijing when I really feel like I was kind of at the elbow of, of history, um, helping to cover Michael Phelps's eight gold run. And, and because the swimming was airing live in the States, when it was airing, I would be just off camera watching it. Um, most nights, you know, right next to Bob at his, his desk. Um, and the writers were kind of at a little studio bank, uh, right, right nearby. And, um, and it was just a scramble. We're trying to put into context the ultimate Olympic history. Um, and fortunately, uh, my background in swimming and my passion for swimming um, created, a, I, I think, a, a degree of, of trust uh, from Bob and my my fellow writers in there. Where I, I don't know, I, there, it, it was just a remarkable thing to uh, to to be there in that context. Like when he out touched um, Mike Kavik in the hundred fly. I mean, it was it was legitimate pandemonium in the studio, and then you just have to get your act together instantly and come up with something, hopefully intelligent and putting the race in historical context, but also um, you know living in the moment and um, you know just just uh, em embracing it and knowing that that's going out to how, however many tens of millions of people. It was it was a really really special time. It, I mean, despite the uh, you know by the end of the these Olympics when you're working for NBC or probably any of the networks uh, from other countries. I mean, it, you feel like you need to sleep for three weeks. It's a lot mm -hmm. easier being an athlete and competing and then having some fun, but it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's brutality, but it, it leaves some, some really, really great memories. And also it, it, it teaches you in some, maybe some not so 
pleasant ways, the way, uh, you know, it, it really is kind of a giant reality show. Um, mm. And particularly American athletes, they're, they're expected to perform and not just perform, but, you know, follow the narrative. And the, the only uh, winter games I worked was 2006 in, in Turin and Bodie Miller there. I mean, you can almost characterize him as like the anti Michael Phelps in terms of a guy who was the face of the sport, but really just defiantly refused to, um, to say what people wanted to hear. He refused to even admit that he wanted to be there. You know, he made clear his priority was the world cup and not the Olympics. And the backlash against him was, was a remarkable thing for me to witness behind the scenes where it was, it was almost just outrage of, does this guy not get it? Like, you know, we're, we're, we're setting up his career. We're giving him more exposure than anyone could ever receive in an Olympic sport. And if you don't play the game, the, the people that uh, control the game, they, uh, they get bent out of shape pretty quick. So in terms of that, like you being a swimmer and being on that side of being an Olympic swimmer, being on that side of it, and then being on the other side, what what changed for you? What what were you seeing that you were like, oh, that that's really that's really hitting home for me now in terms of what the Olympics is? In a way, it made me um, more of like a fierce defender for the athletes. Particularly, you know, I referenced them being almost reality stars, and I found myself in a lot of different memorable conversations where I would, um, you know, really be coming. I felt like I was coming to the athletes' um, aid and being trying to trying to be an athlete voice within the context of, you know, they were, I was being paid to do a, uh, do a job for NBC and that's to, uh, to help write and um, put the, put the games in context for American mm -hmm. viewers. But, um, but a, a lot of that, I really, I found myself getting increasingly loyal to the, to the athletes, particularly when, you know, one that jumps out at me is uh, Lindsay Jacob Ellis when she was, I believe like 18 and she fell in the winter Olympics when she was on the way to gold. And, um, you know, there was, I just saw some, some, some ugly reactions from, from producers. And, you know, this was in a very, you know, talented, naive 18 year old that had a unfortunate accident, a huge moment. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think that seeing that made me, uh, fiercely kind of protective to the athletes. And it also, it, it, it would get, uh, any, I think swimmer fired up when they cut to commercial during the mile or something like that. <laughs> That, that, that to me, and I'll never get over that, particularly um, in, uh, what was it, was it 2004, or maybe, maybe in both cases, but in 04 and 08, there were just in incredible races, and it hit 1,800 meters, and it's like, you don't think the audience can pay attention for 15 minutes straight, and they went to uh, a minute-long commercial and picked up with 200 meters to go, and of course, the whole context of the race had changed. Um, so, so things like that, you know, you it, it, it's easy to to be cynical and go back to your your athlete mindset and not your um, not your job your broadcaster mindset. So what I understand you have a pretty successful learn to swim business in um, New York as well. Imagine swimming is that what it's called? Yeah, it's called Imagine Swimming. We're uh, almost twenty years old, which is wow. really, really bizarre. We founded in June two thousand two. Um, my business partner who. Um, there's a contemporary of yours, same events. Uh, his name's Lars Mersberg. He was a, a German swimmer, um, won all the German relays back then, and graduated from Berkeley. He was the captain in, uh, in 2000, I believe, was his last year. Um, so he and I started in 2002. Yeah, we're almost 20, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's grown an awful lot. Needless to say, uh, you know, it's been a hell of a year with, uh, with pools. Uh, still, All our pools still aren't open. Our, our main ones, fortunately, are open, and we're – we're getting back to business slowly but sure, uh, surely. But uh, man, it's uh, I, I keep saying with uh, with this pandemic and all the closures, if you're a, a business engaged directly with humanity, whether it's going to shows or Broadway or sports events or restaurants or bars or or what have you, and uh, you know you're probably affected more than any other type of business. And teaching swimming, coaching swimming, uh, we have a water polo team, a synchronized swimming team. We try to kind of encompass all that that FINA has under their tent of what aquatics is. We that imagine we try to encompass that too, but our, the core of the business is swim lessons. Um, and the school, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's been, it's been really my passion that and writing for the last, uh, 19 years. Yeah. I imagine 
with with the shutdowns and everything that was going on over the past year, it must have been touch and go at, at some stage where you you may have thought you may not make it out of this, right? Yeah, it's been in, intense. I mean, now that we, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't. Maybe we were in in uh, some kind of survival mode, denial. But I don't think for a second, Wires or myself um, or any of kind of our core team ever ever allowed that thought of maybe not making it ever even to creep in. Right. But, uh, I do think there was some kind of mixed up stages of, of grief in a way. Um, and I think that's probably true of a lot of swimmers, a lot of teams, but you know, right when the shutdown happened in March 20, I think that first thing was, was kind of like panic and paralysis. And then over the summer 2020, it turned into denial um, where you know, it was nice out and things were getting better. And then I think mentally, emotionally, or psychologically, whatever, whatever term you want to uh, use, the fall was, was hitting bottom, um, realizing the second wave was uh, not going away. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we gradually start to turn the corner. Um, it's by no means over. We're not back to, you know, we're close to full strength yet. But uh, I do, knock on wood, I think the worst is behind us. And, you know, swimmers are back in the water and we're, you know, we're coming back to life. Why did you decide to get into Learn to Swim and, and why New York? Uh, a couple of reasons. I mean, to be, to be completely forthcoming, I always had an ulterior motive, um, in terms of starting or co-founding my own business. And that was that I, I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a fiction writer. And, right. um, and I recognize particularly working at NBC that if you're working at a network and you're, you're on somebody else, you're on someone else's clock and, you know, there's, there's no one writing good, good books that are, you know, that are also having a career working at, at a network that demands your uh, your your entire waking life, really. Um, so I really, you know, that was the ulterior motive to create a uh, a lifestyle and a business that allowed me to pursue my uh, uh, writing passions. But also, I mean, specifically about the business, Lars and I recognized. Uh, he came to New York City in two thousand one. I was here in ninety uh, eight, and we were introduced between mutual close friends and we recognized pretty quickly that there was a giant hole in the market for the biggest city in, in the U S um, yeah, there were, there were some schools, but by no means comparable to like, we always look towards um, Northern California um, kind of, I think always had to me anyway, the most established some school industry in the U S um, but really we, we looked to Australia. In fact, when we were kind of hashing out the business to, to get ready to launch it, we bought all the uh, Australia learned some books and talked to Australian swim schools, and that's really where we oriented ourselves. That we feel like that's, you know, the the industry there is is I think a couple decades ahead of where it is in the U.S. And um, you know, it's it, it was a, an opportunity that we were I think we were lucky to to recognize, and then we managed to tap into uh, to a certain market in, in Manhattan. But to your uh, to your question of why why swim lessons instead of um, immediately teams and and the competitive end of it, um, you know, what a lot of it is, you know, we, we didn't really want to pour our energies back into that competitive life we lived. We wanted to be more about sharing the joys of swimming. Mm -hmm. um, also, frankly, you know, we're, and we'll get into this, I think, talking about, um, you know, International Swim League and um, the founder's question of why are swimmers so, quote, poor and everything. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of in the business of, of monetizing swimming pools and, if, if you look at it from that lens, not why are swimming swimmers poor, but what's the best way to monetize these chlorinated holes in the ground? Um, I think you've, you've, you'll figure out pretty quickly the, the single best business you can have in a swimming pool is, uh, is a learn to swim program. I mean, there, it's, it's not even close. And it's, it's a very simple reason for that. To be a, an elite world-class swimmer takes um, two, two things that dominate all else, and that's time and space. And uh, in New York City, time and space is measured. <laughs> it's uh, it's measured, you know, to the foot. The leases are through the roof. Everything is is monetized um, in a really unforgiving way. So if you want to use a pool, um, you better be able to meet a rent that is uh, far exceeds really anywhere else. I think in in the U.S. anyway, and you have to learn how to uh, create a business out of it. Yeah. Well, you, you, you're doing a great thing, I think. And, and that's kind of why I asked that question, because in Australia, it's very common for, you know, if you're going to start a business, it's going to be a learn to swim business. And yeah. 
you said, I agree, it's 20, 30 years ahead of, of the US and it just doesn't seem like that business model is, has taken off for whatever reason in the US. It's always like club first, I'm going to start a club and, and build from yeah. there the competitive side. But the, the learn to swim side seems to be such a, a huge market to me. So uh, I'm, I'm glad someone like you has tapped into that and, and, and doing, doing well in that industry. We're, we're by, by no means alone and I think um, you know, a, a lot of uh, former swimmers, not that they're just saying, what, look what imagine swimming in New York. Like there's, there's an awful lot of other great swim schools that have been founded and have grown enormously over the last 20 years. But, uh, but I, yeah, I do think it's, it's backwards the way traditionally um, the U.S. has looked at like club first and then create a learning right. school. Like you have to build the foundation first. And at these swim school conferences, there's a stat that uh, everyone likes to trot out comparing um, New York to Sydney. Um, say, you know, the populations are different, but say biggest, biggest city uh, here, biggest city in, uh, in the U.S. And... I'm going to get the number wrong, but I think there's something like 40 some schools, something in, in that range in Sydney versus less than 10 in New York. Yeah. So right there, you know, you can look out the window, you can look out my office window right now and spot half a dozen bars and restaurants. They're all competing for the same customers, but you have a very, very small number. And that's true of, of most U S cities. Like there's just, there's not enough. And you know, the, the population of children isn't getting smaller. So, um, yeah, I do think there's a lot, an awful lot of opportunity there. There is, and, and I'm glad you're in it, and I'm sure people can reach out to you once they listen to this and maybe maybe get some advice from you. But um, in terms of how we came together just recently, I mean, it was just kind of like seeing comments on, on Twitter, you know, a little bit of back and forward between you and Alex Perry. And like I said, I'm not here to um, cut him down or, um, you know, I didn't bring him onto my show to then turn around and, um, you know, humiliate him in any way, you know, but, uh, but certainly I, I saw that you had an opposing view and, and uh, opinion. And so I thought it was interesting enough to at least have a conversation about it, you know, and, and look, I'm not the, I'm not the smartest person in the room in any of these podcasts. I just like to let my guests talk and, and, and kind of have conversation. I think that's, that's what my, my listeners like too, is that it turns into a conversation. So in terms of, just some of the things you and I were talking about or even just some of the things you want to talk about, like, what do you want to say? Um, well, I guess first I, you know, for, for better or worse, like I, I've, um, I've long struggled with, uh, keeping my opinion to myself. <laughs> uh, um, uh, you know, that, the column I wrote for years, uh, cap and goggles. Um, it, I think, the overall majority of the things I wrote were, were really positive, but those weren't the ones that people remembered. There were, I made some enemies writing that stuff. And it was, you know, my, I, I looked at my own personal mandate when I was doing that to just try to tell the truth about some in the way I, I, I heard it. And, and having, having done that for a few years, I um, was really lucky to get um, a book deal for my crime novel. So I've set, set that aside and, and focused fully on fiction where writing was concerned. But yeah. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not doing these opinion pieces and trying to pick fights anymore. Um, but I read Alex Perry's piece in Outside called uh, "The Plot to Kill the Olympics," and it, it fired me up in a lot of different ways um, that I just I couldn't resist. So I posted something on my Instagram that uh, called it I believe I said "Great Reporting, Disgraceful Journalism," um, which I I think both those are true and can exist at once. Um, and he saw it, um, you know said I was trolling. I, I, my, my definition of trolling is clearly different from his because I'll put my name to uh, any opinion I have and I'll explain exactly how I reached that opinion. So that to me is not trolling. That's pointing out that this is someone who, yeah, he, he worked hard. Uh, you, know, he, you know, I think you said a couple times in your podcast, he spent three years uh, researching and stuff. But um, the, the story of the plot that killed the Olympics, that, that was a, a lovely op-ed piece. Um, it was an even better public relations piece for uh, for the International Swim League, it was not a piece of investigative journalism um, because it was, you have a, a writer who was, I I mean, besotted and so blindly smitten with his quote protagonist um, that uh, that it just was, it was overwhelming. It was it was actually really stunning how, and he, he uncovered some, some really interesting, fascinating reporting on the, the, the bad guys. Um, 
in that in that piece. And obviously, the Kremlin and and Putin being the central bad guys, and then getting into FINA and the IOC. Um, and as I as I put on that uh, when I first commented about the story, like to me, it, if you're paying attention in in any respect at all to to Olympic sport, um, you know the claim that the IOC, FINA, and the Kremlin, I mean, they're the personifications of corruption. Like they are, you cannot have a more obvious statement. They they personify corruption at the very height. So that's not news to me. Um, you know, and explaining explaining the obvious to the uninformed doesn't make you a professor. Um, and I think that's kind of what Alex was doing in that that piece. He was just explaining the obvious in can you believe this sort of ways. And and some of what he found, like for instance, the fact that so much of the power structure of the Kremlin, starting with Putin are active swimmers. Um, I, I found that fascinating. And there was a lot of really great um, research and reporting in there that, you know, just the image of Putin swimming, swimming 200 butterflies, which evidently he does um, in his palace pool and in, you know, in his thinking through his days swimming every day, like that, that's like just an, an amazing visual to me. It's like a, the Bond villain, uh, you know, just roving <laughs> under his palace and cranking out sets of butterfly in his 60s <laughs> and then coming to do some some horrible dastardly thing you know with the with the rest of his day um so so yeah i do think it's it's important to make a distinction between reporting and um and actual investigative journalism um because he he really did uh he was so blindly besotted by um by constantine the founder of the isl that there was the blind the blind spot is hard to overstate um, you know, when, when it came to his, it was, you know, once you decide something's black and white and I believe in the podcast is he used that exact line, it's black and white. So, you know, to me, you hear those words, you've already, you've confronted a mind that's already made up. Um, you know, and nothing's black and white, especially when you're going up against huge corruption. Like it, it's, it's just, it's not black and white. It's not cops and robbers, good guys versus bad guys. It's all shades of gray. And, um, you know, it's, he's not, he's not alone in, um, you know, in, in doing that, that good guys, bad guys, black and white journalism. I mean, 60 minutes has been accused of doing that for as long as it's existed. You know, they take a thesis to start the start reporting and every, everything is in service of the idea that they've already decided on. So that's not really, you know, you're, you're just, you're reporting to prove your point that you already decided upon before you've even written a word. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, I mean, you could call it like the hero trap where you decide this is my protagonist. I'm going to write around, I'm going to write around him being the good guy, no matter what. So. Look, there's so much to unpack here. I'm an Olympic athlete myself. I've, I've coached at Olympic games. Um, I've, I've also been part of the ISL in the first season and, and, um, I'm very close with a lot of the people that are still involved in the ISL. I don't personally have anything against the Olympic games. And honestly, I don't have anything personal against the ISL. I think, I think they're both great. You know, I've, I've yeah. had great experiences at the Olympics. I've had great experiences with the ISL. I think they've been very positive in my life. Um, but I, I think, think that's it's certainly, so, certainly worth a discussion, right? Well, yes, I, I think you're, you, you described it perfectly. Like, and I should, I should have said this right up, up front. I mean, we both, we both have really close for like um, lifelong friends um who are are deeply involved in the isl and i i want to see it succeed i'm not mm -hmm. i'm not sitting here saying like you know i'm i'm anti this this league i want to see pro swimming succeed i want to see friends succeed that are now coaching it. i want to see you know current pro swimmers have a chance to make a living wage all that stuff is is uh would be lovely i hope i hope the league manages to fulfill some of its uh um some of its ambitions um but when you when you you can make that statement but that doesn't mean you're plotting to kill the olympics and that is it that that becomes a really just hyperbole that uh, uh, just just silly um to say like i'm if i'm pro isl that means i'm anti-olympics no and that's nothing could be further from the case um, right. you know, I want to see both succeed as you do. Um, and 
I, you know, I do think, and like you said, there's a, there's a lot to unpack from the fundamental economics of Olympic sport, um, from doping, from you know, the corruption of, of the IOC. But, uh, you know, uh, I, you know, I, I, I just want to stress that like I'm sitting here saying, you know, this is, it's, it's, it's either or because it's not, and it doesn't need to be. So why have the discussion? Why, why are we talking about it then? Because I think what we've both seen is that it's not um, perfect, right? The ISL is, is not perfect. Yeah. And I don't want to, I got to be careful here. I don't want to get myself in, an, in any trouble. You and me uh, both. You know, <laughs> but, but I've seen instances in the ISL where I'm like, this is, uh, and I've seen athletes get caught in the middle too, of like, look, where we've kind of gone against the IOC by, by siding with the ISL. So we can't, now then say that we're not happy on this side either you know so that i see athletes getting caught in the middle and i and i, and I see that's kind of where coaches are getting caught too and, I, and to yeah. be frank, that's kind of where i'm getting caught you know it's like yes there there are so many great things that the isl have done for swimming but being in it and also being part of it i also see where i just have questions that just are unanswered and and yeah. i and i just sometimes i just want answers and yeah. I can't go into something blindly and say this is the answer to that and not know where this is all coming from, you know? Yeah. I don't know enough about Constantine to say he's the man, he's the answer. Everything he does is above board, you know? Yeah. I, I don't know. Well, I mean, we've, you know, obviously we both have to choose our words carefully on, on certain, um, certain areas here, but... Um, I think, and I, I noticed a parallel um, in, in reading it where um, it makes sense to me that a lot of swimmers really have, um, have really jumped on board, um, but I, I think there's a real awareness um, to swimmers. Um, I, I do push back a little bit on this notion that swimmers just have their head underwater and they're just not paying attention and they can't be expected to make uh, informed decisions because they're too busy training. I, that's just not true. Um, and it kind of disrespects, uh, you know, the swimmers, um, awareness but um you know it's it, it's a very very tricky thing because you have a uh you have a situation where someone wants to upend the status quo and that means um picking enemies um and uh you know and it doesn't need to be a a quote revolution um i think that's a that's a word that's that gets cheapened when they use it in marketing that way and you know, without naming any names that were highlighted in the piece, but you know, there was there was one uh, Olympic champion named uh, prominently um, considered uh, an inspiration for the ISL, who is um, who, who will who will uh, not say uh, you know, you won't hear very many nice uh, opinions about about that um, from from their perspective. And then you also have people that were absolutely. Um, praised in blind context by Alex Perry um, and a one page Google search about some of these athletes um, might have given him pause before he uh, he picked his heroes um, in terms of, of hit the way he created you know the, the side so I mean I at one point I think in your your uh, interview with him I, I just I, I actually started la like laughing really out loud where he, he said there's a there's you know with the ISL there's a simple solution for doping Ban anyone who dopes. Boom, done. I, th I think that, that was the exact quote, and I just burst out laughing. It's like anyone that's even the, the passing knowledge of of doping in world sport has to laugh at a, a comment like that, particularly from a journalist who said he just spent three years reporting a story. I mean, and named people in the piece in the most um, glowing terms that uh, should say are are dubious athletes. So. Um, yeah, I think I think the ISL. I want to see it succeed for obvious reasons um, because I want not just friends, but the swimming community and swimmers um, to earn a living wage, and I want to see swimming become more popular and get to those TV rights and fill up arenas and all that stuff. But there are there are real significant, um, not rumors, but actual significant things that need to be addressed. And I've I've personally sat across a table and heard the the financial projections and goal valuations um 
for for the league, and they're um, untethered to reality would be a uh, um, a point way of, of saying it. They're not; it's not realistic. So, you know, you have this uh, the sense of the uh, the white knight billionaire coming to rescue um, r- rescue you know hardworking people, and I by that in that sense, it's really easy to see how a, a magazine journalist would be so seduced by it because this is something that happens in journalism, especially in magazines, so often where journalists like swimmers, there are some of the hardest working um, devoted professions out there. And in the end, you have an extraordinarily uh, wealthy Ukrainian um, businessman who is funding it entirely himself. And um, it doesn't matter who, who you're talking about or where they come from or how rich they are. At some point, these are these people became very wealthy for a reason, and they don't just arbitrarily lose tens of millions of dollars on end. And at some point, it has to support itself. And um, Alex never had a, a straight answer for how it could possibly uh, support itself. I don't really see a a way that uh, that this can uh, can turn the corner and, and really become a, a going concern um, without the funding of of Constantine. Yeah, I think he's been immensely generous. His passion for swimming is unquestioned, so that should be applauded. But um, but you and I have both heard plenty of cases where people aren't getting paid what they were promised. So I, I hope that's not the beginning of a, uh, of a situation that could unravel. Yeah, I think that's my biggest complaint. And I, and I don't think, and I'm speaking out of turn here. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think, I think season one, there were there were talks that athletes weren't getting paid, you know, mm-hmm. uh, for, for certain uh, performances, you know, the performance money came extremely late and here we are at the end of season two and the same thing has happened again where athletes haven't been paid their full amount of money that, uh, you know, let's just talk about prize money itself. You know, in yep. terms of prize money, they've raced these meets we're talking, you know, over six months ago now, and athletes still haven't been paid. Uh, there was also talk of an Olympic solidarity where, you know, during the COVID period, the ISL would pay everybody on their roster a certain amount of money per month. And I know that hasn't happened. And, and so, again, this is, I'm not, this isn't a, re- a revelation, you know, this is just talk amongst the athletes and coaches. And now there is, um, this kind of requirement to promote season three and we haven't closed the books on season two. And, and these, you know, the the whole reason why the ISL started is because swimmers didn't really have money. Yeah. Well, if you're not paying the athletes for the performances they had over six months ago and they don't have any money, it's hard for me to say the ISL is the answer and Constantine is the man who's going to save swimming when these athletes haven't been paid. Exactly. And that's, you know, that's, that's the thing. And, there were there were obviously a number of uh, of items in the in the piece that uh, that got me riled up enough to uh, you know to post a very critical uh, opinion about the story. Um, that it's the reason we're sitting here talking about this now. But um, again, it goes back to the you know if if this is three years of reporting and and this investigative piece and in uh, Alex's interview with you, he mentioned how Summers have been. Blown away at hearing the uh, the dysfunction of of FINA and the ILC, which you know, I, I don't. I think everyone already knew that. Um, but he, you know, he mentions repeatedly how you know, in speaking with swimmers, he he says you know, Constantine's clearly a um, man of his word, and, um, and this and that, and swimmers all have, have trusted him. But yet, among swimmers for the past couple of years, well before this story came out, while he was reporting it, I mean, it was it was an open secret that. There was a lot of grumbling that people weren't, weren't getting paid. I mean, it's it's just it, it, it it's not like this was something that like you know don't tell anybody. But did you hear? It was just this, this is things that that people were were talking about. Right. Uh, I mean, it was even you know I I read the, this uh, this site. I'm sure you do too. Uh, Swim Swam. That's I think is maybe more famous uh, for its uh, its comment section than the actual stories because the comments get quite lively and everything. But there, there was a couple hundred uh, comment thread after season two, many of which saying, you know, given given details and saying you better cash your check if, if you're lucky enough to get one. Um, so it, the, the the chatter has been 
out there for quite some time. Um, you know, we're not, I, again, not, neither of us want to name names or amounts. I think that's inappropriate to do. But the fact that um, promises aren't being kept, um, financial promises aren't being kept and honored is something that has been noted pretty widely already. Yeah, um, for sure, <laughs> for sure. And that, that's the only thing that really concerns me in terms of the production and my experience with the ISL and, and everything that I, that I saw and everything that I experienced. I mean, I had a great time and, and obviously what you see on TV is what you get at the pool. I mean, it's, it's fast paced. It is all the top swimmers in the world. Majority of them are there. Um, I've, I've heard um, some inside stories of why some of the top athletes aren't there as well. Um, and that, that can be kind of concerning as well, but uh, so it's not fully, fully supported, but uh, for, for the most part, most of the top athletes in the world are there, but certainly there's there's a lot of grumblings around the fact that the athletes aren't being paid what they had, had earned, you know, and I think that's my biggest concern is I've always been an advocate for the athletes of like, look, yeah, you guys need this money. Like, can we, can we pay them so that I don't have any problem promoting season three? Let's just close the books yeah. on season two, you know? Well, if the, the thesis of the, uh, of the league was why are swimmers so poor, then the very first thing, I would prioritize would be let's make sure we put the money we promised in their pockets. That's, 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 that's what started kind of this whole, and I, you know, and, and Constantine is by all accounts, everything I've read or heard is an intensely intelligent human being. Like, you know, no one, no one makes that, that level of fortune um, without being, I think, hyper intelligent. I mean, so he, he started with a very, you know, kind of scientific thesis. Why, why are swimmers, quote so poor and and tried to to monetize that and i applauded for it and i you know i i went to you know when that uh, uh on cbs they they aired uh the two-hour special i was i was skeptical at first and i i finished watching it really impressed and really enjoyed it i thought it was the production values were good i thought it was a, a fun event to watch i didn't entirely understand all the rules by the end but right nevertheless like it, it was it was well done so there's there's so much to to like and hope for. Um, so I just think it's it's that I just keep going that, back to that point that this isn't like saying like okay, kill off the Olympics, make it a sideshow, and the ISL is the future, like, and leave everything else behind. Like these these two things do not are not mutually exclusive. Like I want to see swimmers make a great living wage. We want to see arenas full. We want to see. Uh, see them get paid what they're promised and then still have the opportunity to go to the Olympics because I don't care what anyone says at this point, it's, it's not going the way of a, uh, well, the Olympics for swimming will never be the sideshow thing it is for soccer or tennis or, um, or, or even basketball, um, you know, where it's great. You go, you represent your country. There's a lot of pride to it, but it's really not, it's, you know, the World Cup is the World Cup and soccer at the Olympics is just not a priority. And same goes for tennis, same goes for basketball. There's other examples, but that's never going to be the case for swimming. And it's not just wishful thinking, it it displays a, a fundamental lack of the business of sports in America and the way athletes earn their incomes, at, you know, in American or in, in you know, most of the world sports. I'm not going to sit here and Try to describe the economy of, of live sports um, in countries that I'm, I don't know enough about to, to speak confidently about. I'm not sure how it's going to be monetized among Chinese athletes, or uh, you know, or South American athletes, or, or anywhere else. But I, I do know a few things about the the business of professional sports, and those things that make so many properties worth so many billions, they simply don't apply to swimming. I mean, it it is a sport, like it or not that is strictly bound to the Olympics. Yeah. I mean, you'll never take, take it from me that I, I, I don't want to represent my country at the highest level and I don't want to compete at the Olympic games, which has this immense history. Um, you, you'll never take that from me. The, the fa that fabric will never be removed from me. You know, I'll always want to represent my country at the Olympic games. And I think that's, that's what swimming is about, you know, and, and if you take the two biggest sports at the games in terms of swimming and track and field, uh, you know, track and field has a, a professional league, but those guys want to win Olympic gold medals. That's the that's the biggest thing they could possibly do. And so I agree with you 100%. That will never 
go away. It doesn't matter how much money we pour into the ISL. The ISL will be um, fantastic in the future as a supplement for sure, I think. But but trying to pit the two against each other, I just don't think is the right thing to do. No, I think it's it's both naive and inappropriate to do that and ultimately hurts the athletes to pit the two against each other. Um, you know, and um, in the piece, or I, I don't even know if it, it appeared in in uh, in the Outside Magazine story, but in your interview with, with Alex, he mentioned... Um, his, his exact line, I believe, was the entire thing's a crock of shit. And that's, he was referring to the Olympics. The entire thing is a, quote, crock of shit. And he goes back to the very, you know, he said, look at the founder of the modern games, Pierre de Coupertin. Um, he, was a, he was a bad guy. He was a white supremacist. He was um, a misogynist. I mean, he, he was a, a bad, not, not a good person by most uh, human standards. Um, but he was the creator of the modern games. Now, if the founder is a... A piece of shit. That doesn't make the entire enterprise that that he helped spark a crock of shit. I mean, to make a very obvious analogy, Thomas Jefferson was a slave owning, cheating bastard, and I mean, well established. That doesn't make him being a founding father. Doesn't make the history that he helped start um, all a crock of shit. And you know, whatever side of politics you might be on, you can have the opinion that the entire government's a crock of shit, but that doesn't make the the place we live in a a total um, a, a total loss. And maybe in our most cynical moments we uh, we see it that way and that's that's fair enough. But you know, I, I feel like that that kind of overly quoted uh, Fitzgerald line, like the the sign of a first rate intelligence is the ability to have to equal and opposing ideas in your head at once and still function. Mm. It's, it's a bit like that where, you know, you can acknowledge that the IOC is festering mess of corruption. You, I mean, the FINA is a festering mess of corruption. I mean, the Kremlin, like why, why even let that it's, it's beyond even mentioning the, the corruption. It's so self-evident that that can all be true. The founder can be awful. The, the apparatus that controls it can be awful and, and badly in need of change. But that does not change the fact that the Olympics themselves still are one of the most beautiful, unique displays of humanity and, and one of the great events on the globe and, and will continue to be so. And that's due to the athletes. And it's due not just the, the Olympians, but all the athletes that have tens of thousands of athletes that have a dream of making the Olympics someday all the parents and coaches that help facilitate that dream, the few that uh, you know were lucky enough to get there, um, you know the the beauty of that and and the beauty of the Olympic movement transcends to me far and away any kind of backroom corruption, whether it started with the founder and whether it continues to this day. You know, doesn't make it right, but right. the Olympics themselves, um, you know, are are one of the one of the best shows of humanity that I think uh, I think we have in the world. So, you know, when I see a, a headline of a story that says the plot to kill the Olympics, um, you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna have a a personal uh, a, a personal take on that and push back I think pretty hard against it because you know you're you're missing the point if if you think that uh, the behind the scenes corruption negates all the beauty that uh, that the Olympics really can offer. Absolutely. I 100% agree with everything you just said there. You know, my experience swimming in an Olympic final in 2004 and competing against the top athletes in the, in the world on that day and then racing and, and losing to Gary Hall Jr., you know, for him to win his second gold medal from 2000 to 2004 back to back in the 50 freestyle and then him getting out of the pool and him jumping out of the pool and the first reaction he has is to hug every person in that race and and say thank you and congratulations and and to hug them and and to to get embraced by gary hall jr just after he beat me you know knowing that i had just given everything i had he had just given it and he came out on top and and the first reaction is is to hug me you know and that experience will that's that's the greatest day of my life in terms of athletic performance in terms of my athletic memory that will never go away. And I, I mean, that just gave me chills hearing you say that. I mean, I, I got, I, st I have like chills right now, and that's it's a perfect example. It's like that's th those kind of moments. Like that's 
that is completely divorced from any kind of financial concerns or mm -hmm. corrupt concerns or any of that. That is, that's sport and sportsmanship at its best and most pure. And that's, I'm, you know, I, I had heard that story. I, I remember Gary winning by one one hundredth and, mm -hmm. You know, I, I I love the fact that I don't think this is something a record that can ever be topped. But Gary has two individual gold medals in the fifty free by a grand total of one one hundredth. That's madness. He tied in Sydney and won by a hundredth in Athens. That's madness. That's I, incredible. I, I, I yeah. Total side note, but I just I, I love that that it's you know. Yeah, I have a picture of of him hugging me, and and that memory is just uh, that that's my greatest memory of my of my whole athletic career and everything that I did, every training session I went to, every performance, every every time I I, I lined up against anybody to be to be embraced by the Olympic champion just after being beaten by you know a tenth, couple of tenths of seconds, you know, came down to nothing. But uh, that's it, man. That's the Olympics to me, and that you know, yeah, my whole life was in in in. in wrapped up in that one performance. So, yeah. um, my, mine was, to, I mean, and on a similar, but it was totally off the, the pool deck, but the memory I always go back to was the closing ceremony in, mm -hmm. in Atlanta where the opening ceremony is it's, it's tense for the few athletes that, that March, a lot of the swimmers don't anymore. Cause you know, you're on your feet for a long time, but you know, you have your competition leading up to it. So it's a, uh, it's a very different mindset. It's, it's joyous and you, it's, it's overwhelming, but, the, the nerves are, are really, you know, lurking. But the closing ceremony is such an exhale, and I was just mm -hmm. you know, trading the shirts. I still have my uh, – I traded my, my Canada jersey for a, a Dutch uh, rugby jersey, and I always thought the Dutch had the coolest uh, gear because it was like this loud orange and blue. And, I don't know. The, the, for, to me, the Dutch were always the most stylish of the, uh, mm -hmm. of, uh, of the gear. Um, but, yeah, I'll never forget, you know, everyone just taking off their gear and, and just chatting and, and trading – I mean, I don't know. You get you could do worse than uh than show that to to kids and say you know this is what the world can be and you know it's it's there's always going to be ugliness behind uh, behind the scenes. But yeah. you know this is. Oh, oh, I want both, man. I want the Olympics. I want the ISL. I'm just saying, both of you do better. You know, like <laughs> yeah. I don't want the I don't want the Olympics to be corrupt. I don't want all the money going to you know everybody else except the athletes and and in the last couple of years since the isl have come on and to see what fina have done in terms of putting together meets where they're actually paying athletes decent money that's good to see it's like there it is you can do it you do have the money so i know that so i'm that's what i'm saying is be better isl be better I'm, i don't want you to go away yeah. i got nothing against constantine you know like be the best ceo you can possibly be I mean, just get the get the money of the athletes. You yeah, know? he's. I mean, he's not wrong by taking a, a look at the way uh, Olympic uh, sport operates and 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 calling out the uh, you know a lot of the corruption and the hypocrisy. He's not wrong about that, and he's also not wrong that it's insanely difficult for all but a tiny handful of swimmers to make a living wage after college. It's yeah. insanely difficult, and it, it, it will remain so. And if he could do a some small part in making that happen. Good, great on them. That's fantastic. If you can get somebody on TV more, fantastic. But you gotta you gotta follow through on the promises. And I think there also needs to be a lot more uh, realism in terms of the economic modeling um, and projections that they're talking about. And right. there needs to be more responsible reporting. You can't have you know mm -hmm. stories that say we need to kill off the Olympics and make uh, the ISL great, and then have a reporter who's um, you know, so so enthralled by his protagonist of a story that he uh, he, he misses the bigger story um, that is that was sitting right in front of him. I agree. In in terms of that, I think that's fair enough. I think we've said said enough in in that respect. Um, are you allowed to talk about Katinka in any way, and and what the situation with with that? Sure. Absolutely. If if someone just does a Google search for you, one of the first things that comes up is is your situation with Katinka. I guess you wrote a piece, well, back in 2015. Is that the right? Yeah. Time? You wrote a piece on Katinka that got it, got you stuck in a, a lawsuit with her. So in, just just give us a little bit of background on it. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. So May 2015, um, it was when I was writing this this column, cap and goggles, and. The piece came out. Um, it was the, I put the headline "The Smell of Smoke," um, where you know the 
not so subtle uh, jab, and the piece was anything but subtle, um, was where there's smoke, there's fire. And um, I had been emailing with uh, some some of the folks that I consider the the absolute foremost expert and insiders in all of the sport. Um, and there was there was a lot of talk about that. There was a lot of talk about it on on pool decks, and there was a lot of raised eyebrows about uh, her her results and her her late career improvement, uh, et cetera. Um, and and I wrote a a a very clear opinion piece, and it was uh, it was opinionated for sure. Um, but uh, Swimming World uh, picked it up. They asked me to repost it, and. That's when it kind of, and I said, okay, I probably should have thought that through a little bit more. <laughs> I I'm not sure it would have, it would have kind of taken on a, such a, such a, such craziness um, if it hadn't gone to a much bigger platform like Swimming World and if it just stayed on, on my, my blog. But in any case, it did. Um, she was soon calling uh, press conferences in, in Hungary, uh, denouncing me. Um, got my first death threat. That was nice. Um, and then got uh, sued for five million dollars for libel and defamation. Um, and you know, I guess the the, first, the main lesson I learned is that freedom of speech is definitely not free. Um, it and uh, you know, I not, neither case it was it was such a, a frivolous suit. It was so open and shut and clearly um, not remotely a, 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 any chance of winning. There's never even a remote like worry about her actually winning the suit. Um, it was dismissed twice in federal court, um, uh, both times it never went to discovery. It was it was dismissed uh, summary judgment, um, first in federal court in Arizona. It was filed there because that's where Summer World is based and we were co-defendants. And then it was dismissed when she appealed by the Ninth Circuit. Um, so no discovery, nothing. Um, it was flat out dismissed, but uh, even to get there, cost an awful lot. I mean, to be sued for $5 million is a, is a pretty, uh, is, is, is not a pleasant experience and, mm. it, and it costs a lot to defend yourself. Um, and I certainly learned particularly with, um, with libel, but it's, there's lots of other areas of the law, but the law, it can be weaponized. Um, it can be used as a very effective weapon. It can be used, um, to silence people and, um, you know, it, it can be used to, uh, to, you know, if, if one party doesn't like what the other party's hearing and believes they have um, greater resources at their disposal, um, maybe underestimates who they're, um, who they're suing, um, you know, it, it, it can really, uh, it can silence people. It can be used, it's, uh, it's very ironic that, uh, you know, the freedom of speech protections are hugely expensive. They're not free. And, uh, and those that think they have, um, you know, maybe a leg up um, on, uh, on on financial might, even if they they maybe don't um, try to weaponize the law, and um, that's I guess that's what I what I experienced. Um, when that was dismissed a couple of times, were you able to recoup any of that money, or was that just a straight loss? Straight loss um, in terms of all legal fees. Um, interestingly, it's it's a very state by state thing, and I I mentioned a couple times to uh, lawyers and friends and stuff how. If if I hadn't been the one neck deep in it, it would have been such a fascinating, um, just an intellectual study of the way things operate and the way people can seek revenge for opinions they don't like. Um, and uh, yeah, in the state of California, evidently, because I guess maybe it's the it's kind of the fame capital of America, um, and there's more libel suits there than any other state. I learned, um, and those in in California, um, you. If it's dismissed, you will be recouped um, by the person that's filing. Um, right. In New York, where I live, and in Arizona, where Smear World's based, the, those states do not have that statute. So, uh, so yeah, it was it was a uh, was it a very expensive winning uh, winning battle. Because it was an opinion back in in fifteen. Has your opinion of her changed in the last? Oh, season? not a not a bit. I mean, my I, I'm not going to restate my my opinion ad nauseum. Um, yeah, you know, it, like you said, you can you can Google it, and uh, it's one of the first things to appear with uh, with my name, and I believe with with her name. Unfortunately, it's no fun being uh, you know the way uh, search engines go. It's no fun when a negative thing appears uh, with your name on the first page of results. Um, but now my opinion hasn't changed a bit. Right, right. I was just grateful that uh, 
you know, my right to, to have that opinion was, uh, was upheld. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even though it costs you a lot of money, it's, it's nice to be able to defend your opinion in that sense. And, and like you said, it's, a, it's an opinion that it, it wasn't like, um, did, did, did you base your opinion on things that you felt were factual? Sure. And that's, I mean, that, that goes to part of the, uh, even though it didn't go to the discovery phase, which is essentially like, you know, you learn, you have to disc- you know, disclose all your sources, and right. email, text, everything never went to that. But, you know, I wouldn't have written the, that, an opinion piece like that if it wasn't backed not only by experts' opinions that I trusted, but also data and people showing me, you know, you know, it was, it was a, I, I still strongly believe it was a very informed um, opinion. And uh, I mean, repeatedly, ironically, <laughs> it's, it gets forgotten, I think, as it was being litigated. But I think three or four times in that, that piece, um, I kept saying, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I've just, you know, I've seen it enough times. And in, in context, um, I guess I should have mentioned uh, right away what, what really I think got a, uh, got me emboldened to to write that in the first place was it coincided it was, it was May 2015 but at the time I was um, writing a documentary it ended up being called the last gold and it was about the 1976 um, Olympics and specifically about the one gold medal the US women's swim team won the foreigner free relay they didn't they were shut out the East German uh, women won every other uh, race at the meet and um, and it was a absolutely tragic thing to to research and really for uh, for your energy and not not only because you know there's too much sometimes put on you know the the you know poor Americans being cheated out of uh, out of events they rightly should should have won and you know Shirley Babishoff being vilified in the American media for speaking the truth um, and, and really horrible things were said I mean we we dug up archives where she was called the ugly American and so many different pieces and she was she was speaking the truth it, athletes she was racing were overwhelmingly obviously doping and what was way more heartbreaking than you know make, winning a couple of silver medals instead of a couple of gold medals I, I know that's that's devastating for someone who really should have been a more of an Olympic icon and uh, and respected um, you know in Olympic history as one of the all-time greats because because really is but it was more heartbreaking hearing from these uh, East German uh, swimmers because they they were they were bigger victims than mm. on top of the podium than anyone else. I mean these were these were girls that were told at twelve years old that they were forced to be on doping regimens and they were it was almost like they were being picked and recruited like potential Thorbreds where you know they were they were chosen from these you know they're small towns, big cities, they were chosen from age group programs based on different physical attributes and potential that uh, the scientists, not just the, co- not really the coaches, they weren't really the ones with the say, it was the scientists. And they were, they were forced to dope. This wasn't like a, a voluntary thing of someone selling their soul for uh, Olympic ab- excellence. Cause that's really what, what doping is in the end. Like it's just, it's, it's selling your soul uh, for, uh, for, you know, temporary excellence in a sport. But, uh, but with these women, it was, I mean, it was, it was horrible. It was heartbreaking that they, they, when I say they were forced to, to dope, it would, it meant not just if you say no, you're out of the program, you can't be a swimmer anymore. That a lot, an awful lot of those, those athletes would have taken that bargain and said, I'm not doing this anymore. But what being forced meant was if you said no, not only were you out of the sport, your parents were not going to find work. Your living situation was going to change drastically. Your entire family's living situation was going to change drastically. Mm. I mean, it was, it was abuse. I mean, it was child abuse, and it was later, you know, officially declared child abuse in German court after the the wall came down. I mean, none of these uh, these scientists and and coaches really paid a price, but you know, and having uh, seen and logged, you know, hours and hours and hours of of videos of these East German athletes um, that were forced to uh to take i mean this was kind of the birth of doping in the in the modern world it was really 19 mid 1970s um and east germany at the time was was pretty far ahead in that regard or at least willing to uh use their uh i mean they they called themselves guinea pigs in some ways um other athletes called themselves um you know soldiers in track suits but they were uh 
they, they were used. They were, they were used in any way uh, possible. And then they were spit out. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it was a, a really tragic story. Um, and in that, in, in light of that, and that was kind of what I was living every day, you know, whether it was, um, trying to put a script for the film together or being the editor or you know, whatever it was, I was kind of living with the simmering outrage over doping. <laughs> and, uh, and then I would go home and like you, I mean, I'm a massive, some fan I always will be. I'm always looking at the results every day. I'm looking at some sites every day. It's just part of it's my, my passion. Yeah. So I'm seeing something that I feel like is just happening in plain sight, right in front of me, right in front of everybody. And then I'm waking up in the morning and going and telling the story of Shirley Babishoff and others who spoke up and were vilified. Um, yeah, the, the irony is it, looking back now, six years, exactly six years, I don't think I quite appreciated just how ironic it was that I was defending someone 40 years later trying to make make things right for uh, for people that were cheated out of uh, things and, and athletes that were abused. And then I, uh, I mouthed off with a, a, some really strong opinions, albeit very informed opinions that were shared by uh, you know, a lot of people uh, who's um, not just their their brains I respected, but their data. Um, and and I got I paid a pretty big price too, not nearly as high a price as, as Shirley Babishoff, but uh, yeah, but yeah, I, I got a uh, I got slapped pretty good too. Do you ever, your wife ever just tell you to shut your mouth? I mean, on a daily basis, but not. <laughs> 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 yeah. I mean, I, it's, it goes back far before I was married. I mean, even my <laughs> coaches from 10 years old will hasten to, to point out that, uh, there's, I, I should, uh, should not be so quick to share all my opinions, um, all the time. But, Just but, to broadly speaking, do you think the, the, the drug issue is still widespread in swimming to today? Like, in, you know, we're a, a couple of months from the Olympics now. So it's like, is this still a major issue? Of course it is. I mean, it just, it, I, I don't think it ever won't be. Um, and I, I, there hasn't, to my knowledge anyway, there really hasn't been stories about this yet. I hope there will be in the next uh, couple months. But you have a situation where the world, the world's athletes were scrambling to train any way they could during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And they were not being subject to surprise out of competition testing because the world was in shutdown. Now that, that to me leaves, if you're just looking through the lens of doping, that, that leads a, a pretty big opportunity to, uh, to if, if you're so inclined to, to uh, go down that road because there was probably never a better opportunity to get away with, uh, with some performance enhancement than uh, the year 2020 when you could be sure that testing was not what it, it was before, hopefully what it's come back to being now. Um, so, right. so yeah, I think that's, it's bound to be, I don't know if there'll be a story at, at the Olympics as far as the broadcast goes, because I think the broadcast likes to do everything they can to shy away from, from those things. Right. And I doubt there'll be positive drug tests despite, you know, ISL's the uh, opinion of one test and you're done, boom, it's solved. Like, well, no, that's not really the case because I, I maybe you share the same opinion, but to me it's, there, there's two things to, uh, to test positive. Um, one is you have to be doping and two, you have to be stupid. And I don't think, I don't think people that are doping are stupid. Um, maybe some of them are, and you know, some are being coerced. I'm sure to this day in certain companies, their countries, they're, they just do not have a choice, but, um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of people that whether they're coerced or they're doing it themselves, um, that are, bad actors and are taking performance enhancing substances that are also not not pretty well informed and pretty intelligent about what they're doing and being very well aware of how to get away with it. Yeah, for so, sure. I just, I just see positive tests really, it, a negative test really just mean, is meaningless to me. It's just kind of lip service. Yeah, I mean, especially when you watch a documentary like Lance Armstrong, where, I mean, that guy was just adamant and I was a believer, man. He wrote books about it. Like, uh, and yet here he was the whole time doping. And it's like, it, it's so hard to believe anyone in that sense. Um, you know, but, but I, I've always tried to kind of give everybody the benefit of the doubt, you know, but, uh, yeah. 
Yeah. With, with, with Lance, I, I think the bigger sin, because I think it's fairly well established that everybody behind him was, was on the, the same. Uh, yeah. Same. This is what, what's more unforgettable to me is all, all the lives he really, I mean, he was nasty. He went, he really, mm. he went scorched earth, whether it was journalist or fellow competitors, he really tried to wreck lives for anyone speaking the truth. And that's, um, well, I mean, you just went through a, a massive court case of somebody you feel pretty strongly about. So you, you had a, probably a very similar experience, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think Lance probably takes the cake in terms of yeah, sure. lo long term. Um, you know, but it's 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 funny the way some people get forgiven and some people are forever pariahs. I mean, how is how is A-Rod this rehabilitated kind of like a love celebrity investor commentator like this guy's a this guy's a flat out cheat that, you know, if you sign a two hundred and fifty million dollar contract and you're cheating for those results that to me is financial fraud and <laughs> and no one looks at the finances of it but like if you're winning if you're winning a million dollars on the world cup tour or you're signing hundreds of millions of dollars for your pro sport and your results are based on illegal substances that's that's financial fraud in my mind my eyes you know um you know i I don't know. So the the forgiveness element to me is is very curious. Uh, maybe it's just a matter of personality. Where Mark McGuire's seems to be a lot nicer guy than Barry Bonds. They're both absolute cheaters um, that hit very long home runs and uh, you know thrilling to watch. But Barry Bonds is someone who seems like a surly, probably not as likable guy, and he's you know a pariah in the sport that he was the all time great in and Mark McGuire's a hitting coach, <laughs> you know, it's it, the forgiveness side of it is, is quite curious to me of, of who we, who we give a pass to after time has been, uh, after time's passed and who we don't. Well, I will say this just in case anybody's wondering, uh, I, I haven't seen your daughter and I haven't even really read your article on Katinka and I haven't gone into the whole lawsuit itself. Um, my personal opinion on Katinka and my experiences with her have been nothing but positive. Uh, I've seen her. Uh, I mean, I mean, she, she she's a worker. I've seen her work. I've seen her behind the scenes. I've had conversations with her. Uh, you know, so I'm just I'm, look. <laughs> I'm not saying you you were wrong or right. I'm just saying my personal experiences with, with Katinka have been very good. Good. I mean, like I said in the. Repeatedly a piece. I hope I'm wrong, but this is this is my opinion, and my opinions were not uh, were not pulled out of, of thin air. They were right. based on informed conversations and data. So, no. Right. Unfortunately, even though it's not cheap to defend yourself, um, I don't uh, I, I I don't take for granted that uh, that we we live somewhere where we we, we can have those opinions. I, I think uh, I think I would be poorly suited to be a, a Russian journalist. Say. Um, I would certainly hate to, uh, to to consider myself an expert on the Kremlin and and mouth off in my opinionated way, and I'd be so lucky to be sued and not something much worse. So yeah, that's, um, true. that's true. Even when it cost a few a few bucks, uh, I, I definitely uh, <laughs> I it, the the fortune to have uh, to be able to voice your opinions in a in a strong, sometimes provocative way. Uh, it's 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 a fortunate thing, no matter what. Yeah, absolutely. Now, just to kind of finish up here. I've seen just recently within the last 24 hours some some stuff come out about Americans traveling to Japan and you know basically the 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 level the threat level or something has gone up to a level four you know where yeah, they yeah what, what's that all about I mean your guess is as good as mine these are going to be a weird Olympics right yeah. it's um, it's going to be very very odd for athletes to be competing um, you know I know it's it, right now anyway and we know things can change and you know in days or hours or whatever, but you know, I, I hope, I hope Japanese fans are able to turn out if it's safe to, to enjoy the Olympics. And it's, this is not an Olympics that takes place in empty arenas. Um, but, uh, it's, it's going to be an, an Olympics like no other. Um, I remember in, in Athens in 2004, it was a very curious thing where, um, maybe it was, it didn't quite occur to, uh, to American audiences, or it didn't occur to NBC, but most of Greece, ten, or the city of Athens, empties out in August. It's like the, nothing's open. They empty out. They go to the islands. It's a month off. So the Olympics in Athens 
or even like for the, I remember the gymnastics final, a lot of the swimming, like barely anybody showed up. Like th those stands were, were empty in a very weird way where cameras had to be moved in the position. So audiences watching at home didn't see that the people didn't show up for the Olympics um, in person. Um, it's going to be even harder to, to show that I think in, in Tokyo where, you know, things are going to just for safety's sake, they're going to have to be, be pretty sparse, I'm guessing. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be super interesting. I'm sure the athletes are just going to get, you know, tested after tested after tested in terms of, you know, the, the, the nasal cavity is going to be yeah. destroyed by the end of the games. Yeah. I mean. Well, even, even before that, I don't know if, uh, I'll, I'll be seen in Omaha. I'm going to go for uh, for four days for the that wave two of trials. So like the like the the real trials um, and the hearing about the logistics of organizing that with the testing and and keeping audiences safe and uh, and athletes and coaches and everyone. It's it sounds like one of the ultimate logistical mm. challenges you could you could possibly have. I mean, I, I can't wait. For, I think. Trials in Omaha to me is the best swimming on earth, Olympics included, mm -hmm. as a spectator. And I've, I've been to all the Omaha US trials, and as a spectator, it's it's the absolute best of swimming. I, I've never been to an ISL meet, never, and I've sat in an, I've seen Olympics in person from the deck and also in the stands uh, multiple times, but I don't think uh, I don't think anything compares to Omaha um, US trials. It's it, it, it's the the most exciting our sport gets to me. It is really good. I've been to it myself and had a fantastic time. Uh, incredible. Um, it's up there with the with the Australian trials, I would say. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wish I could say the uh, Canadian trials, and I still try to go to them as a, as a fan every year. And it's, I have an absolute blast, especially when they're in Montreal, which is one of the, the great towns there is. Um, and it's in the Olympic pool, and, you know, unforgettable, like my proudest memories in that pool. Um, mm -hmm. But it's you know filling an arena, fill, filling an arena and putting a a pool there and having eighteen thousand fans. That's a, that's something else. That's oh a, yeah, Incredible. something that uh, you just don't don't get to experience very very often. Amazing. What's going on with Canada? Are they going to have trials or what? What's going on? It's talk about things that change uh, change day to day. I, yeah. I I don't know. I don't know. But I, what is I do know is the Olympics. Canada, come on. Are we going to send a team? What's happening here? Yeah, the, the women's team is is badass. Yeah, they, I, I really want the uh, the guys to, uh, to to start rising um, and get to the same level. But man, the Canadian women's swim team is they they have some absolute stars, some yeah. total studs. So yeah. I, I'm I, I, don't know. I I hope they're I think they're they're, they're going to be on top of the podium in a couple a uh, couple chances in uh in Tokyo. I hope they're standing on top of the podium. But they certainly uh they're. Are better than ever they're great but so uh, we've got to get them there first let's get them through the trials let's get this thing done get <laughs> yeah, a lot of first things first before tokyo <laughs> <laughs> exactly casey this has been fun man i really appreciate your time yeah great chatting that's good yeah awesome uh well we'll get this out uh in a couple of days so right. look forward to it all right cool cheers mate take care all right bye bye